Okay, in this video, we're going to start focusing on the FBX loader itself. Right, the main class that handles loading the FBX file. That's right. We're going to break this up into two parts, and in this part, what we're going to focus on is getting the header and CPP file set up, and the header pretty much complete. Right. And then we're going to focus on the loading code. Right. In the next part, we'll go ahead and get all the drawing code in place. Exactly. So there's still going to be a whole lot of typing in this one. But it's loading. It's just so simple. Yeah, that's what you think. And, yeah. and, and in fact, it is from simple a, for the most part. Right. For, from a conceptual standpoint. Point. It's very simple, but we have to load in lights, right. we have to load in all textures, we have to obviously load in our meshes, which yeah. means we have to go through every single vertex, every single normal, send that over into our mesh class, create the mesh, and so on and so forth. So there's just a whole lot of things we need to do. There is, which means there's going to be a lot of typing. Right, a whole lot of typing. So grab some coffee, sit, sit down. Back. Enjoy. Exactly. Let's get busy. All right. So let's start out by creating our header file. Diddy. I can't even talk today. <laughs> <laughs> so let's create our FBX loader. Okay. Header file. And let me go ahead and CPP create our CPP file. file. Then we'll go and add in our legacy code. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, I'm sorry. If not defined. FBX loader underscore age. And we'll go ahead and define FBX loader underscore age. And end if. All right. So... Some main things that we need for our, our class, uh, for our header file. Obviously, we're going to need to define our FBX loader class. Right. Obviously. Um, and then, of course, we're going to need to include our mesh, which we just created. Right. Just some simple things. And we'll add more includes as we go here. Um, I'm sure we're going to use the vector 3H. Let's go ahead and get that included yeah. in place. And then the rest we could just kind of leave and we'll add in later. No. We'll no. go ahead and throw <laughs> textures in because we know, well, we know we're yep. loading in textures right. we're working with them. And light. Let's yep. go ahead and include light as well. Yeah. Awesome. There we go. That only makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, we need two things, a struct object and our class FBX loader. The struct object is basically, because we now have seen hierarchies, right? Right. Um, so if we have something parented to another object, we want to be able to maintain that relationship. Um, so what we're going to do is do a struct object mm -hmm. and this is going to hold a variety of things it's going to hold its name first of all and it's also going to hold a list of the children so obviously we now have hierarchy so we need to maintain this hierarchy by having objects and we're in our class fbx loader we're going to have a list of these objects in fact let me go ahead and throw that in here just so it's in place so right. in our private section we can throw in our vector object pointer okay and we add in the list of objects nice um, and then back up here, we're also going to need to have a mesh pointer, mm -hmm. which is going to hold the information that we want to draw. And then finally, the transformation data. So our Again, double matrix. Which is all the bone information. Well, well in this case, it's just the, excuse me, um, the, um, the transformation data for just that entire object. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Okay. So this is just a 16-element double yeah, yeah, array yeah. that holds in all the information that transforms it to some position. You in know, space. I was making it into the FBX uh, matrix just for you. Yes, I know. <laughs> and populating it with a lot more information. <laughs> um, so now um, we got that. Let's go ahead and create our constructor that just initializes everything for us. Right. And it just sets the mesh and the matrix to null. Right. Perfect. Awesome. So there we have our struct object. Let's we'll start blocking in what we have inside of here for our class. So our public section, obviously, we're going to need our FBX loader constructor. And we're going to pass it our file name, which is what we want to load. And then our virtual destructor, just in case we want to, I don't know, extend the functionality of our sure. FBX loader. All right. So we need to draw this model. So we're going to call draw model. And this is what draws the entire model, our entire FBX file, if you will. Um, and, and we're it's also going to take a long time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also going to take in a time, so that which is going to be passed from the SDL demo, passing in the tick count essentially, okay. so that we know, you know, which frame to draw, right. how much to increment. But again, we have this whole hierarchy. So what we're going to need is something that draws one object. So we just have a draw object, and this is going to you're going to pass it one object and long time. Again, we need the time variable here. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a recursive function call because this object, you pass it one object, it's going to loop through all of its children and call draw object as well. So it can draw all its children. Okay. And another thing to point out is this matrix um, transformation here. This is a global transformation. This is not a local transformation. So even though we're maintaining the hierarchy, the transformation is still going to be in global space. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 
Um, you sure you don't want to put the bone in verte? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> just scared you half to Yeah, death. you did. Um, also, we're going to have our load FBX, and this is this function is going to be very similar to our the one inside of common dot um, CXX here. If I just kind of move up to the load scene, mm -hmm. uh, not load scene. Excuse me. Uh, I'm just looking for. I'm not seeing it right offhand. Okay, I was thinking in another area here. Okay, okay. Um, so in the load FBX, we're simply going to get the SDK manager set up. We're going to loop through all of our content and start loading it up. Okay. So all of our need, nodes and loading the content. So really all we're going to need to do is pass it a file name. Right. And this is going to handle loading the file and everything. And load FBX is going to call load content, which you need to pass it the scene that we're working with. In this case, obviously, we're only going to be working with one scene, but it needs to recognize that scene. Right. And uh, let's see. Let me call this L scene. And this is following the naming convention inside of their examples as well. So KFBX node and so pass it pnode and a list of objects cool and we're going to be using this list of objects so that as we load in content if we reach a mesh mm -hmm. it's going to add that object into the list of objects and of course now we could have hierarchies here so we need to pass it maybe children mm -hmm. so we're going to need to pass it a list of pointers and this load content is going to populate that list for us gotcha and again load content is another recursive function again because we have hierarchies so load content is going to call itself and occasionally all right so once we got that let's go ahead and create some private functions here um first thing is loading supported textures um, and again, I mentioned this briefly. We're going to have to loop through all the nodes and load all the textures that we need in place so that when we start loading our content in, we know which materials to associate to our meshes. Okay. Um, so in our load content, let's do a KFBX scene. Again, it's going to need to know the scene information. And then another function, load supported textures, and this will make sense in one second, recursive. Again, it's going to be a recursive function. So load supported textures is going to loop through all nodes at the high level and call load supported textures recursive, which is going to call itself. Gotcha. Um, and again, as we start implementing it, it'll make sense if it's a little bit on the fishy side right now. So KFBX node, P node. All right. Um, so we have our objects in our private section. We're also going to need um, a vector list of materials that we're going to create. So material pointer and materials and we're going to need to store the file name a lot like when we created our obj loader that's right and a boolean that just says whether or not the object was loaded successfully cool so in a nutshell that's going to be our fbx loader header file let's go over into the cpp here and first off include our fbx loader dot h this is where the party begins. This is where the party begins. Let me go ahead and go over to our header file, and as I always do, copy over all this information into the FPX loader and start massaging it. And this is where you're going to be giving the elevator music. Doom, 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 doom. So at this point, Joel is now scoping in and setting up our... Let me do this correctly this time. Should have copied it with the... Columns. Oh, wow. That's, oh, I can't believe I did that. Wow. <laughs> Uh, let me just go ahead and put this in here. That was great. Yeah. Everyone makes mistakes. Nah, I know, of course. But I should. <laughs> um, so let me just block in the rest of this. So. Nice. All right. Oh, so yeah. and let me get rid of the yeah. default. Let me make sure I don't have any other defaults. I do not rem No, I don't, I don't have so. any yeah. other ones. All right, so let's start simple. Um, start out with the constructor. Okay. This is easy. We start off by saying the object isn't loaded. Seems kind of <laughs> obvious. Obvious. Um, and then we set our file name equal to whatever was passed to us. So we'll just rename that to file so that we don't have any conflicts in names. Okay. And then if file name um, dot empty is not true, so it's not empty. Um, then go ahead and load FBX and pass it our file name. And that's going to call our load FBX. Simple. And again, draw these two, draw a model and draw object. That's in the next lesson. We're going to implement those in the next lesson. Um, and actually, one more thing before I move on that I kind of just skipped over You're instead of the header draw file. draw face in there? Um, no, no, no. Uh, it was compute transformation. Okay. Um, so let me go into here and void compute transformation. K F 
and this is again one of those functions that was very similar to one of their example files mm -hmm. um, uh, that just basically takes whatever and this will become clear in the next lesson because we'll be implementing this in the next lesson but basically what it's doing is taking your mesh and deforming the vertices according to the bone information so p global position and let me just cab this over because we have quite a few properties here um, so k f b x mesh p mesh k f b x vector four p this is vertex array mm -hmm. and then the next one is just going to be our mesh pointer and then finally we have our k time so we need to know the time information as well right uh, let me change that to p time and then we have our k f b x pose which pose we're working with so our p pose so there we have it. We have our definition for our compute transformation. Let me go ahead and copy this and paste this into here. So where did I put that? Right above load supported textures. So right here. And let me go ahead and scope this in as well. Awesome. Cool. So now let's see. We have our, as I was saying, we can start simple. So we have our FBX loader. And inside of our destructor, let's go ahead and get rid of everything that we have here. Um, the only real thing we have, well, two things. If we go back into our FBX loader real quick, we have a list of objects and a list of materials. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. We need to loop through the objects, and we need to loop through the materials and delete those. So let's go ahead and come in here and do a for int m equals 0. m is less than the size of the materials. m++. Plus plus. And what we're going to do is check to see whether or not we have a diffuse channel and delete that if there does exist one, so materials m uh, diffuse map. And then simply delete the entire material. And now, as I said, we also have our objects, so let's go ahead and do another loop. And all we're going to do is delete the particular object that we're looking at. So delete objects I. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So that's our destructor. And again, we have our draw model, draw object coming soon. <laughs> um, and then our load FBX. We'll start out with this one right here. Um, so our load FBX, as I mentioned before, this is where we're going to actually load the file and where most of the code is going to be handled by, well, uh, the FBX SDK. We start out. We're going to create our FBA, our, C, our SDK manager, excuse me. Tripping myself up there. So our L SDK manager. Um, and then we're also going to need to create a scene. So L scene. Let me just tab these over just to make it a little bit more clean. All right, so what we need to do, L SDK manager equals S, um, K FBX SDK manager create fbx sdk manager a lot of words there yes <laughs> um so all we're doing is creating the manager so that we can well get things going um this is where kind of it manages the entire scene that's why it's called sdk manager it manages creating objects deleting objects just basically everything dealing with the node creation the node hierarchy um so we have if um, the sdk manager did not create successfully Something is obviously wrong, so let's go ahead and return false. Something didn't work. Sure. Um, and then we need to create our scene. So now that we have an SDK manager, this is suddenly very simple. Simply do SDK create um, create KFBX scene. So we just create a scene. Done. Um, now what we need to do is load a scene into the, um, the scene object that we just created. So do a load scene. And actually, um, let's pass our LSDK manager, our L scene, and our file name dot data. And this is where a lot of the work goes. After it does the load scene, it loads all the information in the file into our scene object stored in memory. So it does all the parsing, all the loading, and everything. So once this is done, we have all the information we need to store, get the information from the file, from, from the file in memory, mm -hmm. and store it into our own data types. Cool. Um, but we also, this could fail, obviously. So what we need to do is test whether it failed or not. Let me just create a, a global local variable here, global local variable, called L result. 
Nice. <laughs> Global local. <laughs> wow. Um, and we'll set this to L result equals load scene so that we know whether or not this succeeded. If it didn't succeed, let's go ahead and return false. Um, otherwise, or, or we could just continue, we could just say, all right, now we need to get the root node of the scene. Because, okay, a scene has, obviously, one root node that begins everything, if you will. And then at that point, we need to loop through all of those nodes and call load content for them so that our own code can take whatever data we want from it and store it into our own data types. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is do kfbx node. So this is the node type. And lscene um, get root node. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to first load all the supported textures. And we're going to pass it our lscene. We'll, we'll be implementing this in just a just second a minute, here. Right. And then we check if L node does work. In other words, we do have a root node. Let's go ahead and loop through every single one and call load content for it. So um, int i equals zero. i is less than L node get child count. And simply load content for all of these. So load content, L scene, L node get child i and simply pass it objects cool done um, and then if this works simply set object loaded equal to true let me just put this outside the loop awesome all right um, so once we're done with that let's go ahead and let's see We've loaded the content. We've used the scene as much as we need to. Load content is going to put every, take every information we need, put it into our own data types. So once we're done doing that, we can go ahead and delete the SDK manager. We're done with it. And then we can simply return true, saying, okay, it worked. Cool. All right, so now we got that done. We've already got a, quite a bit of lines of code going on here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and start working on the load content. And this is kind of, uh, or, or actually, uh, let me take that back. Let me go ahead and do the load supported textures. Um, because the load supported textures is going to be necessary first uh, because inside load content, we need the texture information to already be there. Okay. So that in, when we create our materials and assign them to our meshes, we already have the textures there. Um, so if I go down to load supported textures, this is easy. Load supported textures recursive, recursive <laughs> and pass it, well, let's see, p scene get root node. Wow, that was really hard. Yeah. Um, so then in this case, um, we just need to implement the load recursive, which again is going to call itself. Um, so first off, we need to check to see if P node is not null. So if P node does exist, go ahead and do something. And again, since this is a recursive function, we need to have an exit right. condition. So in this case, if P node equals null, that's the exit condition, and it stops. All right, so the first thing we need to do is see what kind of node we're working with here. And to do that, we have our kfbx node attribute. So our node attribute... So let's get the node attribute. So p get node attribute. All our function calls really make sense, so it's kind of self-explanatory here. Um, so let's see if this node, let me go ahead and capitalize node attribute there. So l node attribute. And let me go ahead and block this in here. So if there is a node attribute, go ahead and get, um, get its type and see what we can have here. So switch, this will make sense in just a second. So switch l node attribute. We're going to get the type of attribute it is, so get attribute type. We only want to handle certain attributes. We're, we're looking for textures that are applied to either NURBS, patches, or meshes, or, or in our case, really just NURBS, because okay. um, that's all we're really concerned about. So we're going to say case kfbx node attribute equals emesh. Um, then go ahead and set. We need to get the layer for our particular mesh. So basically, each object, um, a NURB object, a patch object, a mesh object, is going to have layers inside of it. And what we want to do is get that layer and get all the textures that are available in that particular layer. So we need to store this layer information in kfbx layer container. We're just getting the pointer to it. Uh, layer container. And we're just going to set this to null initially. 
And depending on whether or not it's something we want to support, we'll set it to equal it. So L layer container equals P node get ner uh, get mesh, excuse me, and then break out of it. And we can do the same for patches and meshes, uh, patches and nerves, because we do want to get the textures for those as well. So let me go ahead and copy this, paste this in, paste this in. So we're going to get nerve objects, and of course the function call is going to be different here. So get nerve, and this is patch. So there we have our get patch, and once we're done with that, we can simply check. Okay. Did the layer work? Did we actually get a layer? Did something, is it a NURB patch or mesh? If so, then L layer container is not going to be equal to null, so we can do L container. If it's not null, then we also want to make sure that it has a layer. So get layer zero. So this makes sure that it does have a layer. Okay. Um, and then at this point, what we need to do is, I don't see what this is. <laughs> Just had an extra bracket right there. All right, so we have our layer container, and we know that we have at least one layer to work with. Right. So let's get the texture layer. Oh, of course, we can have different layers, material layers, texture layers, etc. So what we're going to do is get the um, texture layer. So KFBX layer uh, element, element texture. texture. Thank you. So much typing. Get layer zero. And then, as we did up here, we know that we have a zero layer, so go ahead and get his textures, which is going to return the texture layer. All right, so if that did work, so it does have a texture layer, let's go again and get the number of um, textures that are available on this particular layer. So we'll do a simple thing, int l count equals l texture layer get direct array not get count. So what this is doing is saying, all right, we have our texture layer. Go ahead and get the array that points to it. So it's just a simple array. And this array structure has a, a type that says, a method that says get count, which returns how many layers, uh, how many textures are in this particular layer. Okay. Um, and then what we need to do is get the, um, the every, every texture that there is, is obviously going to have a pointer to where the file is, unless, it's, of course, it's embedded. Um, so in this case, we're going to need to get the texture file name. So simply get car ptr file name equals l texture get file name. And then let's go ahead and create our new texture because that's kind of important here. Because this is the final thing that we're looking to create is our own texture. Um, so let's go ahead and say bool load texture. What we want to do here is loop through all existing textures and see whether or not it's already in existence. If it is already in existence, simply set texture equal to that and move on. We don't need to load another texture. The okay. only purpose here is to load every single texture that this FPX file references. If we've already loaded it, just move on to the next one. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is simply go for int i equals zero. i is less than the number of textures currently available in our classes. So textures.size, i++. plus plus. And then we're going to say, all right, does texture, textures i, does its name equal the texture file name, which we've just gotten right here? Does it already equal that? So do, do we have a texture that already has this in it? If so, we simply set texture equal to, uh, we simply set, excuse me, low texture to equal false. In other words, we don't want to load this texture anymore. Break out of the loop, and then after we're done with that, we can say, all right, do we want to load a texture? If we do want to load a texture, go ahead and create a new texture and pass it the texture file name. And do not forget to set the texture name over to our texture file name. Our, uh, excuse me okay, here. I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our, I'll texture. I'll texture get name. Right. Then I have a few questions for you. Sure. All okay. right. What did we get elk count for? I know you love changing um <laughs> changing stuff on the fly, uh, but right um oh okay i was this is something I was originally doing. I guess this is just something that uh kind of got left over from I the gotcha. previous. sorry about that. Let me just go ahead and delete that okay, out. thank you very much and then um l texture itself 
Uh, let's see. Oh, right. Right here, I'm getting L texture. Basically, inside of this layer, I need to get that particular element, so I kind of forgot to put this in here. Which is a KFBX texture. Texture, right. Okay, that makes me feel a little better. <laughs> I was like, whoa! <laughs> Something, Joel's I going missed, crazy. I missed a large chunk of code. No, I just figure I'm going crazy. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, it's me, so it's all good. <laughs> um... So let me see. Go ahead and get at I. Yeah, so I. Oh, oh. Not, you, <clears throat> I can't believe I'm doing this. Uh, I can't believe I messed this up twice. You notice that what I want to do is I have a layer, right? right? I have a texture layer. Sorry about this, guys. Um, and I was getting the texture count. Let me go ahead and copy this. Let me undo for a second here. What I want to do is get all the layers and loop through all of these layers. So I'm going to have right here as another loop. Let me call this X equals zero. X is less than the L count. So we're looping uh, through every single layer. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Now I really feel better. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought, man, I'm doing something totally wrong here. Um, and then what we're going to do is get now that FBX that texture. In. Exactly. Right. And this is going to get at the element we want to be looking at. And then the exact same thing. Let's just indent this over. All right, that makes a whole lot more sense here. Okay. So basically, just as a recap, because I kind of messed that up, um, we have our texture layer, which can have multiple textures inside of it. So we need to loop through all of the layers and get each texture, check to see whether or not it already has been loaded. If it has, break and say we don't need to load it. Otherwise, um, load the texture, set its name, and we're done. Okay. All right, so we've got that. Let's go ahead and... Again, this is a recursive function, so what we need to do at the very end here is loop through all the remaining children. So right here, so many parentheses, so many brackets, it's crazy. Which means we're guaranteed to have some interesting things happen when we yeah, go to no compile kidding. this. Um, so l count equals p node get child count. Um, yep. And what we're going to do is loop through every single one here. So int i equals zero, i is less than l count, i plus plus. I'm with you now. And then what we're going to do is load supported, all right, let me see if I can spell this right here. Load supported textures cursive. Very nice. And then simply pass it the child. Um, so p node get child i. There we go. Okay. So now we are loading in every single texture that we need. So one last thing that we need to implement here in this lesson is the load content. And this one's the kind of the, the big one. This one's the one that's going to take a while, if, as if the other ones didn't take a while. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and start out. Again, we're going to need to get what kind of attribute it is. Basically, there's different kinds of objects that we want to handle. We want to handle lights and we want to handle meshes. So we need to get that particular attribute. Um, so let me go ahead and start out by um, initializing an object. So let me go ahead and do... If p node dot get node attribute equals equals null, that means we have no idea what kind of node this is. This is a null node. Um, basically, it's a null node attribute, which means we can't handle it. So let's go ahead and just return. Okay. Uh, or actually, let me go ahead and just continue because remember, this particular node still could have children. It's just one a, a, a gotcha. null node. So we want to continue. Otherwise, if it does have, let's go ahead and get the attribute type. So attribute type equals p node um, get node attribute get attribute type. Okay. All right, and then we do a giant switch case l attribute type. And all right, so we have one case that says kfbx node attribute is of type light. And you can see it popped up here. We have cameras, lights, meshes, markers, null objects, skeletons, patches, and it goes on and on. All sorts of things we can support here. Um, so we have our case E light. And let me just break off of that once we're done. And of course, we're also wanting to support meshes. Um, so let me just put that in here as well. So let me just copy and paste this section. And this is going to be E mesh. All caps, thank you. Um, and once we have our mesh, the mesh is the main one that's going to be taking a lot of work because pages. it's going to be, uh, yeah, pages of work. Um, so once we're done with that, let's go ahead and, let me. I'm just kind of blocking everything in oh, here. Yeah, that's cool. um, this is a recursive function again, so we're going to lo loop through all of the items. 
and call load content for its children. So int i equals zero, i is less than p node get child count i plus plus load content and this is going to be l scene p node get child i and pass it the the next item in the list in other words we want to send objects children right because we have objects was sent to us we want to send the next list or its children um, so let's go ahead and send next list which i'm going to create in just a second on the top here okay um, so let me go ahead and come up here uh, let's see load content right up here yeah um, we're going to create a vector object pointer called next list, and this is going to currently equal object, so we're going to pass the same object to it. Right. But if we have a mesh and the mesh has children, that means, of course, if I come back to the FBX loader and just come back up to here, remember, if we do create an object, that means we're going to have a child, right? So if we do create one, then we can change this next list into the object's children, the next object's ch child. And another thing is we're going to create an object pointer. And once we actually create something, we'll start populating this if it's a mesh. Okay. And we'll create a new object if it's a mesh. Um, the first thing we'll start out with is the easy one, the light. Am I missing anything so far? So far, so good. Awesome. Um, so an e-light. Unless you need this anytime soon. Uh, no, I think I'm good. Okay. Thank you. For those of you wondering, as, as you know, Joel and I will work some of this stuff out ahead of time. Joel mm -hmm. will get everything perfected. We'll talk about it. And then we'll start recording the VTM, and Joel changes everything on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to, from time to time, ask just to see which direction he's going. Right. <laughs> it's all good, man. All right. So let's go ahead and create a light. That was called some filler verbiage so you could rest your fingers for a second. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I needed that. My hands are kind of tired I now. I can see that. Um, thank you. Uh, so inside of here. They're turning blue. <laughs> That's bad. Um, so let's go ahead and get what kind of light this is. So we know it's a light. So let's go ahead and cast our node over to a light. So KFBX light, P light, we'll call this. So kfbx light p node get node attribute. So now we have a light object pointer. Okay. So we can say, all right, what kind of light this is? If the light type is equal to a kfbx light e point, then let's go ahead and create a new point light. So new light light. And we created this way back in the way light class. Way back, that's right. Just to kind of make our lives Starting easier. Starting to tie it all together. Yep. And let me just go ahead and copy this because a lot of typing. Um, so what if it's a directional light? Right. Go ahead and create a new light of type light directional. directional. Okay. And if it's an e-spot. And if it's a spotlight. No. Oh. E spot. Yeah, e I tried to tell you that. That's yeah, all good. Sure you did. <laughs> I just said it was I know, an E spot. I know. <laughs> uh, so we have our light and our spot. Right. So we've created our light. Now we need to start setting the attributes for our light. First off is we need to orient our directional light. With our light class, if you remember, let me kind of bring up the the properties for this here. We have our set spot direction. Right. Um by default the way it works inside of Motion Builder or or the FBX format, excuse me. Um, it's storing that in the global matrix. In this case, we actually need to set it up as a vector. So what we're going to do is say, if, again, p light, um, we're doing this below just so this part can stay consistent. So if we do the same test again, if it's a directional light, let's go ahead and get its transformation. So do a k fbx matrix, um, and then we'll just call this, I don't know, uh, Direction, I don't know, um, equals, and then we're going to go ahead and get its global transformation matrix. So global matrix, KFBX node, E destination set. And this is just the type of global matrix that we want to get. All right, so now that we have this, what we need to do is get the X, Y, and Z locations, because remember, this is going to be a vector. Um, so we need the direction that it's pointing along. And a matrix, remember, we talked about this way back in the matrix discussion. We have our X, Y, and Z axes that are held inside of the global transformation matrix, or, or just any transformation matrix. And in this case, we want to get the Y, because the direction we want is pointing down the Y axis. So the X is going to equal um, direction dot get, and we want to get the second column over and the first one. Okay. The first element. And then for Y, 
Second element, um, third element. So X, Y, and Z. So we're getting the Y, which is the direction that the, uh, the light is going to be pointing. Right. And then we're going to set his position, um, set his position over to X, Y, Z. X, Y, and Z. Awesome. Um, so now, let me see. Uh, remember, because inside of our directional light, when we're using a directional light, the position is no longer a position, but it's a direction that the light is pointing, just That's to right. kind of point mm -hmm. that out again. All right, so now that we have that, let's go ahead, and otherwise, we do want to set the position of our object, so this is easy. Simply create a KFBX vector 4, get the translate, this is easy, get global T, and KFBX node E destination set again. And then we simply pass this into our light. So light, set position. Whoops. And we're going to get translate. In our vector class, we've been doing, uh, let's say, translate.x, .y, and .z. Uh, inside of the, the way the motion builder, the FBX format vector class works, is you use an array kind of indexing method. So 0 is x, um, 1 is y, and 2 is z. Right. And then we have our translate 1 and our translate Two. And these are all in doubles and ours are in floats. So let's go ahead and cast these over to a float just to prevent some problems or, or warnings, excuse me. All right, so we've got that. Um, I think that's everything for that. Let's go ahead and get some information about our light. Of course, we're going to have a color for our light. Color, so, intensity, exactly. several things actually. Um, so let's go ahead and get our intensity for our light. Okay. And this is going to be equal to float p light get default intensity um, so now we got our intensity very very simple um, and of course if you want to check up where um, what kind of names we have here for mm -hmm. the function names simply open the documentation they have an excellent list of all the member functions for a light object a mesh object or whatever so just look at the documentation and there you have it um, but another thing to point out is all of these attributes can be animated so in this case we're simply taking the default value that the light has if the light was animated for whatever reason, you'd have to add an extra code to take into account your lights being animated. But up till now, we've never really had an animated light, and it just doesn't fit the scenario. Right. Um, we need to get our, our our color. So let's do it. KFBX color, light color, and the light color is going to the red component is going to equal. And let me just type this out quick, and then I'll explain this. Current take node. Um, get color r evaluate. Alright, what is this doing? Um, inside of an FBX file, obviously you're going to have multiple takes, and this holds animation. In the case of an intensity, you have a default intensity that you can get. In the case of a color, it's always going to be mapped to a curve, an animation curve. So what we're doing here is getting the current take that we're doing, so get the animation off of that take, um, get its color in R, which is going to return a curve, actually a, a class, a curve class, that's going to have the animation curve, and we're going to evaluate that curve at zero. So we're going to just get, at one point on the curve, um, the intensity. And then we're going to multiply that by the intensity so we can get the final color that we can apply to our set diffuse inside of our light. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so let's go and ahead and... Obviously, we're not intending on bringing in animated colors. Right. So that's why we can just simply sample there at the very beginning. Exactly. Because it should be a flat line. Right. Um, so M green and M blue. So we get the R, G, and B intensities as well. All right. So finally, we simply set the diffuse color. So set diffuse, and we're going to simply pass it the light color dot M red, the float light color... Dot M green, and of course casting it because again it's double, so M blue. And for the final channel, we'll simply pass it one for the alpha of one. Okay. All right. So, believe it or not, that's all there is to creating our lights. Wow. That was the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, now what we have is our mesh, and what this is going to be doing is creating our object if it's a mesh, um, getting all the material properties over. Um, then creating our vertices, transferring all that information, the normals, and finally the texture coordinates. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and start out by creating a new object. So create new object. Set its mesh to null, just temporarily. 
just as a precaution, of course we said this in the constructor as well, this is just an extra precaution. Um, and we're going to set, first off we're going to set the, uh, the transformation matrix for this. This is easy. Mem, copy, because we're using doubles. Copy into our object matrix, which we just created. Convert the double pointer, P node, get global matrix. So we get the global matrix out of the current node. And of course, this is going to be a size of double multiplied by 16. So what is this doing? It's getting the global matrix from our current node, from the FBX SDK, which is going to return a double pointer to us. We copy that entire thing over into our own formula. Done. Cool. Um, and then from here, let's go ahead and set our object name to P node get name. And then let's go ahead and get our KFBX mesh. As we did with the light, it's a lot easier, well, we have to in some cases, to get the member functions that we need to access. So in this case, we cast it over to a light. In this case here, we have to cast it over to a mesh. So our KFBX mesh, P mesh. And then we have our material. Um, and we're going to be calculating this in just a second, or using this in just a second. Right. Um, a, few, a few things that we need are KFPX material. I'm just going, creating a few material um, variables that we're going to be using really soon here. Um, our KFPX texture. We're going to be looking for these things so we know which to apply to the object. And finally, we have our KFPX material layer. So L material layer. So we're going to get the layer. It's a lot like when we did our load um, textures, load supported textures. Same idea here. So load get materials. And let's copy and paste this and do pretty much the same thing for textures. So element texture. This is going to be our texture layer. So get textures. All making sense so far? Yep. Awesome. Um, all right. So we've got that. Let's go ahead and create our new material. So material equals new material. All right. So if we do have a material on this layer, that's important. So if L material, because of course we could just, after we create the material, we could just utilize that default material. But if the FBX file that we're loading does in fact have a material, let's go ahead and load it in and get the attributes from it. So if material layer, and it does have it, the it does have multiple layers on it, so L material layer, and then get direct array, as we did in the past. So nothing really new here. Get count, it's greater than zero. Let's go ahead and get the material. So L material layer. We only want one, we only support one material at a time. Uh, Motion Builder can't have multiple materials, but in our case, we only support one. So we're just going to get the first one available to us. So get add, and then we're just going to pass it zero. Um, all right, now that we have that, let's go ahead and get the diffuse specular and, and ambient from the material. So let's do a KFBX color, get the diffuse, and this is simply equal to material, get its diffuse. Simple enough. And we can apply this to the KD, KS, and KA. Uh, so KD, 0, equals float, diffuse, dot, mred. Very simple. And then we'll do Finally, this. Finally, lots of copying and pasting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and copy that whole thing, yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely not doing that whole thing again. Uh, <laughs> so specular... And this one's going to be ambient. ambient. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this is get specular. And get ambient. Let me just go ahead and copy this over here. And copy ambient. And come over to here and make sure this is KS. Excellent. And this is KA. All right. So we have the texture material. Number one job done. Now we need to check the texture layer and see if we have any information there, and then we're going to loop through all the textures we loaded and apply it to our current material. Okay. 
So if L texture layer and L texture layer, uh, let's see, get direct array dot get count is greater than zero. Let's go ahead and get at it. So L texture equals L texture layer get direct array dot get at one. Actually, I think I made a typo up here. Um, that uh, I wanted to do one here as well. Okay. Um, so let me go I'll ahead. Point that up back out to him. Yeah, time. sure. Where you at? Um, right here in the material. Instead of getting element zero, I'm getting element one. Okay. And I'm doing the same for the texture layer here, which is just the first element in the layer. Gotcha. Um, so let me loop through all textures currently available to me that we've loaded in the load supported texture section. So textures dot size i plus plus if texture textures dot get the current texture see if his name is equal to l texture get name if he is then go ahead and assign that to the diffuse map and then simply break out so we found a texture that we want break out we're done and again it may support multiple textures but since our application only supports one texture we're done right all right, now the fun part. We have our textures, we have our materials. Now what we need to do is start creating um, the points, the normals, the UVs, etc. Um, so let's start out by getting the number of polygons we have. So k int l polygon count equals p mesh get polygon count. All right, so now what we need to do is get all the control points available to us. And this is just an array of all control points. And you'll see how this works in just a second here. Controls points. There you go. Um, K vector 4. L normals. It's going to equal P mesh get normals. And K vector 2. These are simply arrays that hold all the information about this mesh for our UVs, our normals, and our control points. Or our vertices if you want to name them that <laughs> right um so now we have that we know that we have a mesh so let's go ahead and create our mesh or actually i think i uh, already defined mesh up here if i remember okay um i guess i didn't um all right i'm sorry um i thought i already defined a mesh here okay so we have our new mesh so we create a new mesh and now we're going to set our object which we have created right set his mesh i guess that's what i was thinking yeah it was it's um right. object mesh over to the new mesh now we need to start getting these vertices across. So mesh, remember we have vertices, normals, and UVs. UVs. Right. So we need to create the data for this. So simply create a data. Um, get control point count. So P mesh get control points count. So we're just allocating enough uh, memory for our vertices, normals, and UVs at the moment. So for our normals, of course, each of our normals is going to have each of our vertices is going to have a normal. So these two are going to have the same amount of data allocated for them. Right? Right. And then for our UVs, we're going to say get texture UV count. And it should be the same as well, but they have a separate function for it. All right. So once we have that, let's go ahead and assign um, the meshes, num, U, um, num vertices, which we created a long time ago, back, oh, well, back in the last lesson. Let's go ahead and get the control points again. Just set it into here as well. So get control points count. All right. Now, we've got that. Now what we need to do is loop through all of those vertices and normals and apply that and copy that information over into our mesh vertices. So for int i equals 0, i is less than p, mesh get, or <laughs> mesh num vertices, i plus plus. Exciting stuff, isn't it? You just turned into a complete robot there for a second. <laughs> and I equals zero, I less than pi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, of course, the control points, remember, these are vector fours. We're, we need to convert this into our own format. Right. So we need to convert them into vector threes. So we get the L control points. And again, um, we need to get which one we're working with. So I... Once we have this, this returns to us a k vector 4. Once we have a k vector 4, we access we just, the x, y, and z so via we just another index. So in 0, 1, 2. Exactly. Yeah. 
So let me go ahead and copy and paste this. Kind of extending a long way out here. Is that right? Awesome. Let me go ahead and cast these over to floats just so I don't get all sorts of warnings. You're doing great, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot to type. Yeah, it sure is. Um, uh, for our normals, same idea here, um, except instead of using L control points, this is going to be switched over into L normals. Right. L normals and L normals. Awesome. All right. Uh, once we have that, let me go ahead and one more thing. We need to start getting our UVs set up as well. So let me do another loop here. And I equals zero, I is less than. And in this case, we're going to have to do a P mesh get texture UV count. Texture UV count. I have run into cases where, again, not every single UV or, or vertex has a um, UV applied to it. Mm -hmm. So in that case, that is why inside of our mesh we're checking whether or not it's negative one because it may not always have something on it. Um, and that's why we're using get control points count and a separate one for get texture UV count because they may have a different number of um, UVs. Um, so inside of here, what we're going to be doing is doing our mesh UVs and then setting our I to equal vector 3 and setting casting this over into float right off the bat, I and 0. Let me just copy and paste this. All right, so we got that. Uh, I think that's it, right? Looks good. Awesome. All right, so now that we have that, what we need to do is create each of our faces. And in this case, all we need to do, we have the information, the physical information for our vertices. What we need now is the index into those vertices, and that's where we create our faces. So now what we need to do is make another loop that goes between all our polygons. So all polygon count. And what we're going to do is do k int l polygon size. And this is the number of verts for this particular polygon. Number of vertices, if you will. Verts. Um, polygon size i. Then we're going to loop through all of these. So int j equals 1. j is less than l polygon size minus 1. j plus plus. In essence, um, what this really is is triangulation code. Um, I am now introducing you to how to triangulate a mesh. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm starting out and only taking three vertices at a time and putting that as a face, going to the next one, taking the next set, and essentially what I'm doing is triangulating the code because our mesh can only handle triangles, mm -hmm. which makes calculations inside of most games or whatever application you're working with a whole lot easier. Right. So triangulating it directly off the bat is an awesome thing to do. Uh, so let's go ahead and get the index for our polygon vertex. Um, so polygon vertex I zero. You want to go ahead and stick with the uh, the K int? Oh, yeah, thank you. Just to say consistent. That's right. So K int. There we go. Awesome. Um, and this is going to J and, and J, J plus, plus one. one. Yeah. So basically what we're doing is we have, um, let's say, just hypothetically, we have um, uh, four vertices. We have one here, one here, one here, and one here. What I'm doing is I'm drawing a polygon from this one, this one, and this one, then from this one to this one to this one. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so now for our UVs, it's kind of similar, so let me go ahead and copy and paste this in here. So UV 1, 2, and 3. Again, these are just indices, just one integer. Um, and this is going to be get texture UV index. And then we're going to need to add a face into it. So just setting it our indices, index 2, index 3. And the same for our normals, because, well, it's the same thing. So index 1, index 2, and index 3. And then the UV. And then the UV 1, UV 2, and UV 3. And the material. And the material. Awesome. So let's see. I think that's everything for that section. So outside of this loop now. All right, now, for this section, we have pretty much everything we need um, uh, for our 
for our meshes. We have the basic foundation information. At this point, what we need to do is get the animation data over into our mesh, because that's o the only thing that's left. Um, so let me start out by getting the number of takes that we have. We're only going to be using one take, but if one take doesn't work, we'll just keep looping until we find a take that will work. Okay. Um, so we start out by getting all the, the uh, takes that we have. So get array template, k string, pointer, g take name array, l scene, fill take name array, g take name array. And what this is going to do is fill this array template with strings of the names of our takes. So if we have default take 001, take 002, it's going to be filled inside of this G take name array. All right, so we have that. Now let's go ahead and get the number of takes that we have, and that's simply the size of this array that we just filled. So take name array dot get count. And what we're going to do here is loop through all the takes. So let's do a for int t equals zero. T is less than num takes and then t++. Plus plus. Um, all right, so let's see how I'm going to handle this here. Uh, let me start out by creating some things here, because what we want to do is loop through every single time increment and get all the frames necessary, Okay. because we're baking out the information into our own thing. Remember, they have their whole curve node, but what we want to do is bake that information out frame by frame. That's right. Um, so what we're going to do is say k time, current time, and we're just going to be using this to kind of um, move along in time. So start and stop. This is the start and time of our take. And now let's do a KFPX take info. This is going to hold the information about the current take. And we can get that by just saying Elsene get take info and passing it the string. And that's why we needed the string because that's how you get a current take. Um, you reference it via its name. So take, uh, let's see. Where am I? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jake, <laughs> take name, array, T, like so. So if this current take is valid, we can go ahead and start getting information about it. So first thing, let's go ahead and set the name. Um, uh, it's name of our mesh? No, excuse me. Um, go ahead and get set the current take. So basically, when I'm doing various operations, um, getting the global transformation, getting the transformation matrix of a, a, some sort of node, it's going to be relative to what the entire scene's current take is. Okay. So what we need to do is set the current scene's take. So set current take, um, the current scene's take over to our G take, uh, sorry, name array T buffer. And again, I simply misspelled this over here, so let me just go ahead and change that. Okay. So we set the scene's current take over. Now we need to get the current start and stop time of the current take. We have the current take, so we just say current take info um, dot m local time span dot get start. Let's jump back to the beginning of that and put g start. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to set that equal to the beginning, and then we get the end as well in the same fashion. So g end. Is it get end or get stop? Oh, get stop. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Huh. I don't know why. I was just thinking start and end. <laughs> nice. All right. So we have that. Um, now what we need to do is get the total number of frames. Because what we're looking for here, let's say we have our int num frames, right? Mm -hmm. What we want to do is have a loop that says for int i equals zero, i is less than number of frames. And we want to loop through all of these frames and bake the transformation information onto that. Um, and actually, let me add a break into here, which means that this current take worked. So we need to calculate the number of frames we need. Um, and this obviously can be done. It's dependent on the frame rate, right? Okay. If we have 30 frames a second, then the number of frames that we're going to be baking is different. So let me go ahead and go to the very top here, trying to remember where are we at, um, 253 here. At the very, very top here, what I'm going to do is add a constant float frame rate, and I'll set this equal to 30.0f. Okay. So we're defaulting to 30 frames a second, which makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right. At this point, let's go ahead and do a k time time diff. 
in their case, Heim class is taking into account more than just one form of time information. You can get it in seconds, milliseconds, frames, etc. So what we're going to do is take the difference between the start and the stop. So stop and start. And then convert this over into seconds. So get the difference in seconds. So time diff dot get second double. So we get that difference in seconds. And then we need to calculate the number of frames. So simply say um, the frames equals, let's see, um, break this into, so diff multiplied by frame rate. Okay. So now we know the number of frames that we want to have. Because remember, this is seconds. So let's say we have two seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And it's 30 frames a second. So we take 2 multiplied by 30 frames a second. So that means we have to break 60 frames. And then we loop through all of those 60 frames, bake out the information, and we're done. Um, but a, a little other information we need to store inside of our mesh, the frame start, as we discussed in the last lesson. Mm -hmm. So when does it start? Well, simply do g start dot get second double. Times frame rate. Uh, times frame rate. So I'm, again, this is in frames, not in seconds. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go ahead and convert this entire thing over into a float to prevent casting problems. Frame end. G stop. Or it's probably frame stop, isn't it? No, it's frame end. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's what's confusing me. <laughs> I keep changing my own terminology here. Um, and finally, um, I'm going to set the current frame equal to the start frame. All right, getting close here, guys. Um, Real close. Now we need to set the pose, because we're going to be calling compute transformation in just a second here. So let's get the current pose. L scene. Get pose. Zero. So just get the first pose, whatever it is. Loop through all of them. And what we're going to need to do is call compute transformation. Compute transformation. And we're going to need to pass the global position of our mesh. So we need to get that somehow. Well, remember, we have this almighty get position mm -hmm. that we have. So what we're going to need to do is utilize that function call. So kfbx matrix With p, p global, global position, position equals get global global position p mesh get node and we're current going to need time. To current time so pass it current time and l pose. L pose. Nice. Awesome. And then inside of transformation, we need to pass it P global position. We know that. Mm -hmm. We also need to pass it the mesh. We know that. We need to pass it the control points that we have. Yep. Our normals. Our normals. Our mesh. Current time. And our current time. So, yeah. Current time. time. And L post. Uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, I think I messed something up here. Uh, oh, not our L normals, excuse me. Just our mesh, and then because we're not actually transforming our normals, and then pass it our L pose. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and then finally, we need to update our time. And again, the time that's stored internally is in seconds or, or their K time um, class here. So we can't use our frame terminology. So what we're going to be doing is increasing our G period, um, which we still need to define. And basically, G period is simply saying, um, what is the size of one frame at a time? So let me go ahead and add this right before I loop here. So K time, G period. Yep. Um, G period dot set time. And we'll set the number of hours, zero. The number of minutes, zero. The number of seconds, zero. The number of frames, one. And then we're going to set field to zero. Um, and then we're going to set the residual time to L scene and just get the global time setting so it can set it automatically. Global time settings dot get time mode. Cool. And I think I spelled K time wrong on most of these. So let me just go ahead and capital K here. All right. So I think that's pretty much everything. Um, just looking back over this. All right. So right after we get our um, right after we break out of this and we get to here, right before our break, what we need to do is push this object into our list. We have a list of objects, right? And we've just created a new object. So let's go ahead and push this object into our list. So do a pushback object. And then remember, now that we have an object, when we call here, our next list is still pointing at objects, right? So we need to update that and say, objects should now point at, uh, uh, next list, excuse me, 
next list should point at object children. And now when we call load content again, it's going to start throwing the objects into the current op previous objects um, next list. I'm just a little concerned that we may have okay. oh, I put think that I, one too far, one outside the scope of uh, what we wanted. I think what we wanted was here, right? Yeah, with the break in there with it. Okay. That was just too many. It gets yeah, kind of confusing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me just kind of loop back up here. Yeah, and then, and then we end off with, yeah. Right, okay. So that's awesome. pretty good. So at this point, we have whew, a lot of typing. <laughs> a lot of typing. 378 oh. lines of code. Over an hour of typing. Yep. Um, so at this point, we have pretty much everything in place here. All we need to do is create our draw object, draw model, and our compute transformation, which is a fairly involved function, but it shouldn't be too bad, especially not in comparison to this lesson. Right. And then once we're done with that, we'll do a quick debugging, test it out, make sure everything works good, and then we should be good to go. All right. So that pretty much does it for this video. If you uh, have been completely confused, don't worry. Just watch it again and again. Yep. It'll slowly start to sink in. But with that, thanks, Joel. You've done an awesome job. We'll see you guys in the next video to get the drawing code wrapped up.